grace and peace to you from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, CBC family. It is uh, my privilege to wrap up this series on Colossians 3. It's been a joy to, it was a joy to hear these uh, men speak on the word when we met together uh, to, to plan out the year and, and to, for me to hear the deacon's thoughts on, on uh, how they were trying to best help pastor lead and, and manage the body, especially in these um, odd and unusual times, but I especially enjoy these devotionals. Uh, I just want to remind us that this isn't just a series on Colossians 3, but also these are uh, our key verses, kind of a unifying thought for the body of CBC. If we were all meeting together uh on a Sunday morning, this would ordinarily be what's printed behind us. We haven't made signs yet. It's just, uh, I guess, a sign of the times that we don't have signs. But but I, I'd encourage you to really think about these verses, uh, Colossians 3, 12 through 17, throughout the year, both in your, in your personal life and in our life uh, as a body, as CBC. Uh, how do we... How do we live out the commands of these verses? Uh, so uh, let's open in a word of prayer, and then I'll um, wrap this up for us. Father God, we love you, and we're, we're thankful for your word. Uh, we, we come to you with thankfulness, just as this text um, commands us to. Father, you know our current uh, state of mind as people and as a body, that we are fatigued from an unusual lifestyle. We are uh, earnestly desiring uh, fellowship and normalcy and impatient at times. Uh, but we ask that you would uh, give us peace, cause it to rule in our hearts, that you would uh, give us wisdom. We, we ask that you'd be with pastor and the deacons especially in that regard. And that you would uh, cause us to see that all things work together for good, not necessarily happiness, but good. And that we could uh, learn patience through this process, that you would give doctors wisdom. Father, we just ask now as we come to your word that you would be working through the Spirit to change every part of who we are to be more like the person who we act in the name of, uh, which is Jesus. That you would cause us to put on his grace, that you would cause his peace to rule in our hearts, that you would cause his word to dwell in our minds, and that you would cause us to act on his behalf for your honor and glory. We give you thanks for Jesus, our rock and our redeemer. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. So I'll read this text, give us some brief context, and then, uh, and then deal with the verse that I was specifically assigned, which is verse 17, and the idea of the name of Christ. So let's uh, read Colossians 3, 12 through 17. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. These are the words of God. As a reminder for our context, what we've seen in the past three uh, messages is really wrapped up in in verse 17 although I'd, I'd also say and we'll get to this in a minute that 
this isn't an, an argument that's totally encapsulated in the verses that we're, we're, we're looking at this year, but it, it, it spills over into the practical applications of the following verses, but we'll, we'll get there. But for now, what we've seen so far is that the person and work of Jesus should compel us to uh, put on, to be, to be wearing grace and its fruits, especially love, right? Uh, verse 12 through 14 and verse 14 especially, above all these, put on love. So Pastor George talked to us about how, how the grace of Christ motivates us to, to our, be ourselves gracious and to put on the fruits of grace or, as Paul also calls them, elsewhere the fruits of the Spirit. Um, then Caleb uh, talked about letting peace rule, uh, to, to have the peace that Christ has given us be not just a stagnant, uh, unconsidered or minimized reality, but to have it maximized and taking over every part of our lives um, by letting it dominate um, our awareness of, of who we are as redeemed uh, by Jesus. And then last week, John uh, spoke about uh, the word of Christ dwelling in us, that, that our minds would be a dwelling place for Christ's word in such a way that it would uh, change the way that we uh, live, change the way that our church operates, that it would make, as John pointed out, uh, the, the, the message of, of God from his word, the primary thing that we focus our corporate existence around, which is why we're, we're doing what we're doing right now and why we'll have a service in uh, tomorrow morning uh, and, and why that service, half of that time or, or more than half, uh, depending on me, I guess, uh, will be focused explicitly on God's Word and applying it to our hearts uh, because we believe the Word of Christ ought to dwell in us richly. Of course, one way, and again, I'll just encourage this, one way for the Word of Christ to dwell in you richly is to memorize it, and uh, that's a task that I'll be taking up for these five verses. Uh, as John pointed out, uh, he was my captain in, in uh, Patch the Pirate Club. I don't mean that like that poet society. I, I mean uh, Wednesday night. Uh, he and others were instrumental in causing me to let the verse that tells us to let the word of Christ dwell in us richly, dwell in me richly for 30 years now, uh, since I've, since I've memorized this verse, I'm, I'm thankful that, uh, this is a primary verse that my mind calls to the forefront in, in many conversations about, um, what God's Word can do for us, what song can do for us, what corporate meeting can do for us. This is an instrumental verse. But I have verse 17, which says, Whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. I really have four main points that, that strike me as, as primary and important to us in this verse. Of course, it's a culmination of these other three things. As, as the grace of Christ um, is put on by us, as it's made the, the driving force of our lives, and as peace rules in our hearts, and as the word of Christ dwells in our mind, uh, we begin to do things, right? I, I'm now getting to the action. Whatever you do, I, I, I guess one thing before I even get to my four points is that we, just like most people, Christians are not unique, we tend to want to get to the do thing first. And so we often memorize verses like, whatever you do, which we'll find in Colossians 4, uh, whatever you do, it, it, do it all 
in the name of Jesus, or do it unto the Lord and not unto men. Uh, you know, work heartily. Uh, whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, we, we like to think about doing. And by doing, we often mean actions, the, uh, what, what we do. And we, we often have our, our children memorize these verses, and, and that's good. Um, but doing comes after who you, motiv- who you are motivated by, uh, what you have ruling in your hearts, and what your mind is dwelling on. And we can't short-circuit this. We can't jump over those last three lessons. Uh, in fact, our, our, the, the doing part is only going to be in accordance with God's word if God's word is dwelling in our mind. If our lives are motivated by the grace of Christ and focused on putting on love. And if our hearts are ruled by his peace. Have you ever wondered what does it mean to do something in the name of Jesus Christ? Paul, this isn't the only time Paul says to do that. Uh, it's in Ephesians. And, and as I was tasked with this text, and I, I spent a lot of time thinking about what does it mean to do something in the name of someone else? And, and of course, we have examples and these examples do shed light on what it means. Uh, I, I think of uh, when, we, when we see a wedding done on film or even in, in person. Of course, it's been a long time since I've seen one of those in person, uh, given, given the past year. Uh, but we'll often hear the officiant, whether it's a pastor or, or justice of the peace or, or whoever, say, by the power vested in me by... New York or XYZ, I now pronounce you, right? There's a, there's a sense in which they're saying the agency that I have, the power, the ability is not my own. I don't get to decide that you're married. Someone else makes that call and I'm the intermediary of it. And I think that's a real element of what it means for us to do in the name of Jesus. What we're saying in, in, in Paul's command is that the things that we ought to do, we can only do because the power comes from someone else. It comes from Jesus. Of course, this means that the things that we're doing actually should be things that would be empowered by Jesus. Uh, but we'll get to that in a minute. You know, Shakespeare, maybe one of his most uh, well-known lines is the, is the famous line, What's in a name? That which we call a rose by any other name would smell just as sweet. And so I, I think when we, when we say, do all in the name of Jesus, there's a reasonable question there. Why? Why, when we sing, all hail the power of Jesus' name, what do we mean? Why is the name Jesus so powerful? Well, we, we, uh, we know there's, there's some mystery about how language works. Mystery that uh, no matter what people might tell you, we still don't fully understand. And in one sense, there is nothing special about the name of Jesus. Now bear with me, and please give me grace as I say that. Uh, but we know the name Jesus was not an uh, unusual name. It wasn't the pairing of two syllables or, or, or phonetic noises that had never been uttered before. This was, a, this was a common name. It's basically the same as my name, Josh. Uh, it, you know, it, it's derived from Joshua, uh, the, the idea of being Jehovah saves, names like Josiah, or in, in Jewish circles, uh, Yossi or, or Joshi. Um, 
all, all have the same uh, Hebrew background. And, and maybe we, we tend to think of the name, the, the, the name, the linguistic utterance of Jesus as being unusual because we don't know many. Um, or you don't see others in the New Testament. But, but that doesn't mean it was a common name. But what's being said here is uh, that when we do something in the name of someone else, we are showing their ultimate authority over our lives, and there is only one ultimate authority over our lives, which is Jesus. So that, that, that means that not only is doing something in the name of Jesus about admitting his agency and his power, but it's also about representation, right? When you, uh, if you're into sports at all, or even if you're not, we all get the concept that uh, an athlete is representing something bigger than himself in a team sport. Uh, you know, there's only, there's only two major league baseball teams that do not put the last name of the player on their shoulders, on, you know, on their back shoulders. Uh, most teams do. And I've always enjoyed that the Yankees are a team that does not. Um, and of course, the idea there is that the name on the front of the jersey is more important than the name on the back. And that's certainly true for us as believers. The name by which we do things in is far more important than our own. This has massive application, both for individuals and for the church. Of course, application one is you can't do sinful things in the name of Jesus. And by can't, I don't just mean don't do that, although please don't say you're doing that, but also that, that it's, it's just not possible, right? Our, our, our words and our deeds as redeemed cannot carry the name of our Savior if they don't align with who he is or, or what he's done and the example of what he would do, um, who, you know, he who was tempted in every way, uh, yet without sin. So we, we need to be careful of everything that we do, whether it be word or deed. The, the following verses of, uh, after verse 17 Give us some clarity on that, and I'm going to get to that in a minute. But before I get to um, words and deeds, I just want to point out that we, we, we cannot take sinning lightly given the jersey that we wear. And, and we cannot forget the jersey that we wear, and it can't be taken off. We are called to do everything in his name, forsaking sin, putting on love above all else. Why? Because that's what our Savior did. So, whatever you do in word or deed, moving on to point two, words. You know, it's interesting to point out that Paul here is calling words actions. He says, whatever you do, right, that's an action verb, whether it be word or deed. See, there's, there's a saying that we all know, talk is cheap. And what people usually mean when they say talk is cheap is, is to borrow a, or to use another cliche, put your money where your mouth is, right? Uh, in other words, you can say whatever you want, but what it really comes down to is what you do. And I would say not so fast. Talk is not cheap. Paul, in fact, puts it primary. Whatever you do in word or deed. 
Words matter. Of course, we can't let the word of Christ dwell in us richly unless we use words. And the words that we use really impact the world around us. James talks about this. Of course, Paul talks about it. Um, but we, we need to be aware that Jesus changed the world when he was on earth. And he did that both in word and deed. And our call, the Great Commission, as his disciples, is to change the world going. And the commands there are both words and deeds, or things that are done by both word and deed. Baptizing. That's an action, right? That's a deed. It's a physical thing that we do. But teaching, that's words. Not always words. We can teach someone by example, but we also teach by word. And then discipling, what I would call the, the, the perfect merger of words and deeds. So words are, words are not cheap. And they are actions. They are how we change the world. And that is why we preach the word. It also points out that, that the words that we use, saying them in the name of Christ, are inherently unique. We, we take all kinds of worldly flack, if you will, for being the kind of Christian that says, not all faiths are equal. Not all beliefs are true. Why? Because the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our Lord shall stand forever. And what we proclaim as gospel truth, as good news, is God's word. And God's word says that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through him. And so we, we aren't exclusionary in our beliefs on a whim, but because words matter. This means that what we proclaim as a church matters, and what we proclaim as individuals matters. We'll get to practical application again in just a minute. Deeds, whatever you do in word or deed. Again, fill yourself with grace, your heart with peace, your mind with the word of Christ, then deeds. Don't just wake up in the morning hoping that you can white knuckle your way through the day doing things that would honor Jesus if you haven't done the, the work of putting love on above all else and realizing that Jesus has allowed us to be at peace and to fill your mind with the word of Christ. To, to attempt deeds in, in honor of Jesus without those things is a futile effort. And then to, to put these two together, words and deeds, look at these following verses with me quickly and think about how interconnected our words and our deeds are how it's actually very rarely the case that pleasing God through interactions with people will involve only one of those things. Verse 18, Wives, submit to your husbands, as is fitting in the Lord. Let me ask you, is that done through words or deeds? Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. How is that done? 
words or deeds. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. Bond servants, obey in everything. Uh, those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. You are serving the Lord Jesus Christ. Go on and, and, and see, masters, treat your bond servants justly and fairly. Continue steadfastly in prayer. At the same time, pray also for us, the apostles, that God may open a door to the world. Verse 5, which is so key right now for our lives. Walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. Look at how interconnected these things truly are. Words and deeds. Both of them are actions. They affect the world around us. And for them to be done in the name of Christ, they have to be gracious. But we do these things simultaneously, together. It's impossible for me to love my wife in word, but not in deed, and to fulfill this commandment. I can also just somehow love her without harshness in deeds, but ignore my words as insignificant. Talk is not cheap, and our deeds really matter. This is, of course, true at the individual level. You know, this is a, a pretty, it's, it's a list that includes almost everyone. We all, almost all of us either work for someone or are someone's boss. We're all someone's child. And many of us are husbands and wives. And we all interact with the outside world. None of us are excluded. I don't believe these are meant to be exhaustive lists um, as Paul's um, sections of application in his epistles rarely are exhaustive. And I also don't think this is just tacked on before he closes this letter to Colossians. Oh, and by the way, here's some practical things that I, I thought that I should just throw into this letter. No, instead they're very much tied to the verses that are our key verses for the year. This is what it looks like to fill your life with grace and put on love, to let peace rule in your heart, to um, be uh, dwelling or let the word dwell in our minds, in our lives, and to do everything in the name of Jesus. I close with just one point about thankfulness. This verse, of course, tells us that we should do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. And this is the third time that thankfulness is mentioned in three verses, right? There's a trifecta here. Verse 15, uh, Caleb pointed out that there's a unique construction here where it says to be thankful. Not just give thanks, but be thankful. Have it be part of who you are. And then in verse 16, that as we sing and let the word of Christ dwell us richly, that we should do this with thankfulness in our hearts. And here, everything we do should be in thankfulness to God the Father through Jesus. I would just encourage you to think about what are you thankful for? If you were to record your prayer life, what do you most often thank God for? Is it our daily sustenance? That's not wrong to thank God for, right? We ought to thank him for our daily bread. We ought to thank him for preserving our health or, or, or um, saving a loved one from injury or illness or, or whatever it may be. But how often do we thank him for the very thing that allows us to bring our thankfulness to him? which is our fellowship with him 
through Jesus Christ. I've already gone on long enough here, but consider your, your, your thankfulness. The, the life of thanks that you have. Is it too low? Does it take too much for granted? Are you truly thankful? Are you being thankful? Are you giving thanks in your heart to the Lord? God bless you this week. I pray that we'll see each other and resume a, a more normal fellowship as soon as we possibly can, but we have so much to be thankful for. Thank God the Father through Jesus for Jesus. Jesus.